Well, um, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. So I'm Richard Premack from Boston University. Um, and I'm going to tell you about the research that my graduate students and colleagues have been doing for the last 10 years. Um, we began with a very simple question, which is that can we see the effects of climate change in New England? When we first began this project in 2003, um, I became interested in this because I was working on a new edition of my textbook. And the section on climate change kept, had kept getting bigger and bigger through every successive edition. But all the examples were from very far away. So people were always talking about the effects of climate change on polar bears or things in the Swiss Alps or Costa Rica. But there were virtually no examples from anywhere in the eastern United States. A uh, couple of little examples from around Cornell or from uh, Washington, DC. But no examples from New England. Uh, virtually no evidence for how climate change was affecting plants and animals um, in Massachusetts. So what we started doing 10 years ago was, can we see the evidence for the biological effects of climate on the plants and the animals in the backyards of New England? So we had some, actually that's <laughs> it's doing some funny things with the uh, lettering there. Uh, so we had some very simple questions, which is, can we see the effects of climate change, if we actually go out and we look, can we see any impacts of climate change? And then why should we care about this? So the reason we should care about this, this audience I think is aware of this, that uh, if climate change is affecting natural systems, then this could be driving species toward extinction. A lot of the endangered species in this region, a lot of them are wetland species, amphibians, um, uh, different kinds of fish, crustaceans. So conditions get a little bit warmer, then a lot of these rare and endangered species might go extinct from this area. There are a lot of economically important species like fish in this area or forests that might start dying off if conditions get warmer. And then the other thing which we were concerned about was what are you going to do about it? A lot of scientists just like to write scientific papers, but we were interested to see whether we could actually make an impact um, on the world. And we decided that our impact would be through conversations with people in the media, like yourself, or the general public, or people in government, and tell them about the reality of climate change. So as Candace mentioned, there are a lot of <coughs> physical changes that one can see. Um, so I won't go into it in too much detail, but this is just a graph showing the temperature uh, in the month of April in the Boston area, Blue Hills Reservation, going back more than 150 years. And we can see all these temperature changes and changes in things like the ice out time at places like Walden Pond. So Walden Pond is icing out earlier. The ice melts earlier in the late winter than it did in the past. And this is just a graph for temperature. The one thing which I want to point out which is different from what Candace showed is that the temperature in Boston has increased more than in Rhode Island. And that's because Boston has warmed up, both because of global warming, but also because of the urban heat island effect. So as you develop cities, as cities expand in areas, as you have more parking lots and roads and buildings and you cut down the trees, that also creates warming. So about two thirds of the warming in Boston has been caused by urbanization and one third of it is just the general global climate change. And so cities like Boston are great places to study, to study climate change because they've warmed up as much in the last 150 years as the rest of the country is predicted to warm up in the coming 100 years. So it's a very good model system for studying climate change. I also want to point out 2012, the 2010 up there. So 2010 was the warmest year ever recorded in the Boston area, and 2012 was on track to be, again, one of the warmest years on record. So not only do we have general warming trends, but we're just breaking records at a very rapid rate. So if you want to look at the effects of climate change, two indicators, again, as Candace has already have mentioned, is the effects on phenology, or what is the timing of events. So phenology is the term that biologists use to mean when things happen during the year. So two of the indicators that we can see of the effects of climate change are changes in the timing, or phenology, and also changes in the distribution and the abundance of species. And again, Candace has mentioned these things already. Uh, so what we've done in our research is that we've looked for old records or long-term sampling where people have looked at when plants have flowered or when birds have arrived in the spring. And we started doing this in 2003. And what we discovered was that 
there was a lot of old records out there, but you had to look for them really hard. So if, if, once you went looking, you could find a lot of old records. And the best records that we found were records started by Henry David Thoreau in the 1850s. And this is a, a picture of Thoreau's journal. And so Thoreau had notoriously bad handwriting. He also started off using common names, and then he switched over to scientific names. And his names are different from the names we use today. So once we got a hold of his records about when plants were flowering in the spring that he kept during the, the 1850s, we had to spend a lot of time first figuring out what his names were and then comparing these to modern names. So what we began to do was to go out into Concord and to look at the flowering times of plants in the spring and compare them with what Thoreau had observed 160 years ago. And there was also another botanist that we discovered named Hosmer who also looked at these same plants uh, in the Concord area. So this is a summary of, of all of our data. It often gives me pause looking at this because we did so much work to get this one simple graph. This was just an enormous amount of work over more than half a dozen years, and it's just in one simple diagram. So what we figured out was that we didn't have to look at all of Thoreau's species. We just had to focus on the 43 common spring wildflowers that Thoreau, Hosmer, and we saw in every year. And each one of these symbols represents a year. The yellow symbols are Thoreau's years. And then we have a broken axis here. And then the 18, late 19th century is when Hosmer was active in Concord, observing the same species. And then these blue symbols are the symbols of, of Abe Miller Rushing, a, a former graduate student of mine, and myself in Concord. So these are all taken in Concord for the same species. And you can see that in Thoreau's years, there's a lot of variation. We have very late years and very early years. But on average, the plants are flowering around May 16th. So that's, this is the average of the average is this horizontal bar. And in Thoreau's years, a lot of variation in the late 19th century. <coughs> but on average, the plants are flowering around May 10th. So about a six-day shift in flowering time. And then if you look at uh, the recent years, so these are the blue values here. We have a lot of variation. But you can see that, in general, things are a lot earlier than in Thoreau's time. So plants have shifted by more than two weeks earlier than in Thoreau's time. I also want to point out that this is 2010 right here. And it's kind of off the charts. We thought we would never see a year like that again, because that was the warmest year ever recorded in Concord. And then two years later, we have another record-breaking year. So these things that we think are exceptional become kind of the new normal, the kind of the, the more common situation as the climate changes. So a huge change. So we did this project, uh, when we did this after 2010, we wrote up our results. And this was picked, we also wrote a press release, because one of our goals was to reach the public, in contrast to what most scientists do. And this was sort of picked up in the New York Times. But again, in 2012, we have another record-breaking year. And we're just writing another paper about this, about how 2012 is even more extraordinary than 2010. So this is very newsworthy right at the moment. What is driving this is temperature. So if you can think about all the variables that you want to measure, out of all the variables you could measure, the one which is absolutely driving this earlier flowering time is temperature. So instead of looking at changes over time, this is a graph very similar to what Candace was showing. So on the x-axis, we have spring temperature. And on the y-axis, we have flowering time. And each one of these symbols here represents a year. The blue symbols are the native species, and the yellow symbols are the non-native species in Concord. And again, you can see that when it's a very cold spring, plants flower late. When it's a very early spring, like 2010 and 2012, plants flower really early. So it's really temperature which is driving this. It's not that they're flowering early over time, that they're tracking time in some way. They're just responding to temperature. So it's a very, very clear, very striking relationship. <clears throat> We're also constantly looking for different ways to tell the story of climate change, to find new data which can uh, be used to tell it in a slightly different way or give a different perspective. And so we're also very interested in how climate change is affecting horticultural plants um, in the Boston area. And at the Arnold Arboretum, they have an enormous body of information on when plants flowered in the past using museum specimens. So at the Arnold Arboretum, which is one of the oldest and largest arboretums in the world, they have a huge museum collection of specimens, of museum specimens, which were collected on the grounds of the Arnold Arboretum. 
and by matching museum specimens with when the exact same plants are flowering today, you can again see the shift in flowering time. So this herbarium specimen of rhododendron vasei was collected on May 19, 1938, and this picture is taken in front of the exact same numbered plant that this specimen was collected from on May 3rd, 2010. So these plants are now flowering several weeks earlier than they did in the past. And if we took the same picture on May 19, 2010, this plant would just look like a green shrub and would be very boring looking, which is why we're not showing it. So we try to take great pictures. So another perspective on, on our approach is that we not only try to do good science, but we try to take nice pictures. And this is, this is a nice picture. And so whenever we talk to reporters like yourselves, if you want to write a story about what we're doing, we also have great visuals for you also <laughs> that you're welcome to use. We've also gotten very interested in leaf out time. Most um, biologists, if they're studying plants, they like to study flowers, but we've gotten very interested in how climate change is affecting leaves. So we've been monitoring leaves uh, in the Boston area and looking for stories about leaves. And one interesting story uh, is that we were giving a talk once and a woman came up to us afterwards and she said that she had a very special hobby, that she liked to, that she liked to, <coughs> she collected photographs taken on Memorial Day at historically important cemeteries. And it's even more special. Like, she liked to collect <laughs> stereoscopic photographs taken at cemeteries. And she said she had one photograph which was really different, which was this one on the left. She said this one is different from all the other ones she has in the Boston area. And the reason it's really different is that it was taken on May 30th, 1868, one of the first uh, uh, Wrecking there were first memorials of uh, Memorial Day, first uh, observances of Memorial Day, and you can see that the trees don't have <coughs> any leaves on them. And this is just so extraordinary to have a tree with trees with no leaves on Memorial Day. And the picture on the right is the same view taken um, in a more typical year, so May 22nd, 2010, which of course a very warm year. And you can see that the trees are all leafed out. And when we actually started looking at records, we found that that 1868 was one of the coldest years ever on record in the Massachusetts area. And it just shows you how cold weather can actually delay the timing of events in the same way that warming events can cause things to happen earlier. We've also been looking for bird data. And uh, we're botanists, but we also want to see what's happening with birds. So we want to see if birds are responding to climate change. And what we find is that there's a lot of bird data out there. There's just a surprisingly large amounts of bird information out there. But the bird data is quite different from the plant data. The birds are responding to climate change. They're coming a little bit earlier, but not as much as the plants. So they're responding, but more slowly than the plants. It's really insects that are the missing link. And we, we, for a long time, we thought that there was no insect data there, because when the birds are arriving in the spring, they're eating insects and the insects are eating plants. And so we started intensively looking for insect data. And finally, only in the last year or so, we've discovered that there are large data sets out there about mosquitoes, <laughs> bees, forest pest moths, and also butterflies. And we started to analyze these insect data. And other colleagues of ours are working with us. And what, what we're finding is that insects are also responding very strongly to temperature. So they're strong, responding as strongly as plants are. So they're coming out now several weeks earlier than they did in the past. We're also looking at how temperatures are affecting the distribution of plants. And Concord, Massachusetts is probably the most intensively studied place in the country in terms of what plants occur there and what was there in the past and what's there in the present time. And what we find is that about a quarter of the plant species that used to be in Concord that Thoreau saw aren't there, that about 36% of the species are now very rare. Most of the loss has been in the last couple of years. And that certain plant species are particularly vulnerable, like orchids and lilies, or species that like cold weather seem to be declining more than you would predict in Concord. And that warm, loving southern species, species from the, like the mid-Atlantic states, are now increasing in abundance in Concord. And a lot of warm, loving invasive species are also increasing in Concord. So we really have a change of the abundance of species in Concord, which is matching what we're, we're seeing in terms of the changes in phenology. So 
Thoreau, in this great quote, says, we cannot see anything until we are possessed with the idea of it, take it into our heads, and then we can hardly see anything else. So when we started this study nine years ago, there was no evidence for the effects of climate change in Massachusetts on biological systems. And whenever we go out there and we look at any plant data set for when plants were flowering or plants were leafing out, when birds were arriving in the spring, whenever we go looking for this, we can see the fingerprint of climate change. So climate change is not something which is going to be happening in the future. It's not something which is going to be affecting our grandchildren. It's something which is happening right now. We see it very dramatically in the Boston area because of all this, not only climate change or global climate change, but because of urbanization. But there are studies from all over the country now showing that um, even in rural areas, places far from cities, that not only the temperatures are getting warmer, but there already are significant impacts on biological systems. So climate change is not something of the future. It's something which is happening today and is already affecting biological systems. So thank you very much for your attention.